This is a review of the case study entitled The Scheduling Dilemma by Rupert Ambrose, Rose Bravo, Robert Glover, Craig Kawamura, Liz Miles, Danielle Sherman, and Mauricio Stefan. This presentation is a review of the case study entitled The Scheduling Dilemma. This case study focuses on Sarah, a project manager for a project for an unnamed company. The scheduling dilemma came after a project that seemed to be clean cut becomes a little more difficult than expected. This project started later than most for this company and estimation was now the key instead of knowing exact resources that were available due to the amount of time between the contract bid phase and the go ahead work start phase. The timeline also became unsure for these same reasons. Employees that were available during the contract phase may now not be available for the project during the go-ahead phase. This project was highly sensitive to cost overruns which had to be kept at a bare minimum and there were additional risks that Sarah was now aware of that made her uneasy about the project as a whole. She now had options that she needed to look at before executing the project. In this presentation we will cover how common is this issue are there policies that could be established in order to prevent this going forward? Can you convey the schedule and budget as an estimate to the customer even though they may want these as firm figures on the front end? And what type of schedule compression techniques could Sarah consider as well as their effectiveness? The first question we asked us we asked ourselves is is this a common situation for most companies or an exception to the rule in Sarah's company based on the case study this type of situation appeared to be the exception and not the rule however to us this seemed like it would be more of a common situation in business and project management in business requests for bid can span months the decision making process for companies that request those bids could take even longer and once the bid is accepted there is contract negotiations as well as the legal review of those contracts from both sides before they can be executed which if anyone has dealt with lawyers before they know that this process could take forever and that's just in private business if on top of that you add in government contracts and bids these things can exponentially increase the amount of time from creating the schedule and budget in the contract and bid phase to the executed go-ahead date there are definitely measures that Sarah and or her company could have put in place to avoid these type of issues, which leads us into our next topic of discussion, policies. The next thing we looked at was can policies be established as part of the competitive bidding to alleviate the pain of this occurring on other possible contracts where the contract go ahead date is several months after the contract award. After ev evaluating the lessons we've learned, we definitively decided that yes, policies can and should be established as part of the competitive bidding to alleviate the pain of this occurring in these types of situations. If Sarah's company could have implemented learning or experience curve estimates, and it would have been beneficial in this case. As well as establishing good working relationships with resources may have helped her acquire better resources for her project. She has time to plan all potential risks for this project and Sarah should have been more proactive rather than reactive in her risk management, spending her energies to plan accordingly with long lead procurement put in place which would alleviate her stress. Incorporating good faith estimates can prevent disastrous legal problems down the road. During the contract negotiation and formation there should be terms and conditions incorporated as well as disclosure of available resources to the client. The bidding should contain the date and price estimates only for possible future resource availability. This will eliminate the legalities down the road should Sarah's company not be able to perform up to the definitive contract due to enterprise environmental factors and also help prevent change orders in the project's future. According to Kersner, the objective of the contract procurement is to negotiate a contract type and price that will result in a reasonable contractor risk and provide the contractor with the greatest incentive for effective and economic performance. According to the PMBOK, the legally binding nature of a contract means it will be subjected to a more extensive approval process. The primary focus of the review and approval process is to ensure that contract language describes the products, 
services or results that will satisfy the identified project need. The PMBOK continues to say project procurement management processes involve agreements including contracts which are legal documents between a buyer and a seller. A contract represents a mutually binding agreement that obligates the seller to provide something of value, for example, specified products, services, or results, and obligates the buyer to provide monetary or other valuable compensation. An agreement can be as simple or complex and may reflect the simplicity or complexity of the deliverables or required effort. Furthering the subject of information provided during the competitive bidding process, we discussed is it possible to convince a client that the schedule and possibly the budget is just a rough guess during competitive bidding and finalization of the schedule and budget can be made only after go ahead. We decided, yes, this is definitely possible. In this case, the finalization of the schedule can only be made after go-ahead. Sarah had a few options from the beginning to head this off long before the go-ahead was given. Since risk protection is the predominant influential factor and Sarah didn't know what her resources would be when the go-ahead was given, she needed to reduce her risk during the procurement phase. During the contract negotiation and formation phase, Sarah should have identified and made her contract dependent on the activity resource requirements and the resource calendar. Disclosure is key if, Sarah and her, if Sarah's goal is transparency and to avoid embarrassing her company and avoid additional cost to the buyer. A cost reimbursable contract such as the cost plus fixed fee contract or time and materials contract could help her avoid this predicament that she's in. Separate negotiations could have been made on assignment of critical personnel as well as the length of the contract during the procurement and contract phase. Sarah could have also proposed her own statement of work that provides detailed specifics on how her company intends to reform the work and provide the resources. The objective of the conduct procurement process is to negotiate a contract type and price that will result in a reasonable contractor risk and provide the contractor with the greatest incentive for efficient and economic performance. By accepting the contract as it was, Sarah was taking on too much risk. Now that Sarah is already in this predicament, we discussed what schedule compression techniques were considered in this case. Were there any techniques that Sarah did not consider? Well, the schedule compression techniques that Sarah considered were the compressed techniques. She was concerned about burned out workers and an increase in mistakes that could cause overruns. The crashing technique. This was impossible because all of the extra resources were allocated for other projects. Outsourcing. Due to contractual agreements with the client, no third party outsourcing would be allowed on this project. And the parallel technique. But due to the type of project, none of the work could be performed in parallel. Other options that Sarah did not consider could have been reducing, first reducing the scope by removing some of the tasks, or combining both the compressed technique and the schedule optimization technique. If she can find a balance between the two techniques, avoid burnout while leveling out the resources by closely watching the schedule due times for projects, she possibly could make her scope of work, hopefully with no overruns. Hopefully her worst case scenario will be more, no more than a few days of overrun instead of two weeks. The next thing that we considered in the schedule, in evaluating schedule compression techniques was, was Sarah correct in her analysis that these techniques probably would not work on her project? As a seasoned employee with the company, Sarah made great observation to the issues that would prevent her from fulfilling the deadline of the contract. However, she may be underestimating the patience and desire of the client to have a successful relationship with the contractor. It is in the best interest of the client to make this work. You have to ask yourself, as the PM, why wouldn't the client want this to be a successful build, even if it is two weeks late? The answer to this question can only be answered by the client in an open, honest setting. There is no way to know if there are some financial benefits or commitments made by the client to their future client as a result of the on-time completion. Furthermore, why would a client make someone a commitment prior to the completion of a construction project? 
Construction historically has a difficulty making deadlines due to weather, material back orders, labor issues, accidents, client delays with decisions, etc. There is a high probability that the client will allow adjustments to be made in the timeline since the project is yet to begin. In this case, our point of emphasis is communication with the client. Finally, we discussed <clears throat> if one of the scheduled compression techniques were used, which one has the greatest likelihood for possible, for possible schedule compression? Of the various schedule compression crashing techniques available, Sarah considered just a few. She wanted to avoid telling the customer that there was a problem, and she obviously wanted to be able to deliver a successful project. This desire to save face may have constrained her thinking some. Of the potential solutions, reducing the scope of the project could have yielded satisfying results for the customer as well as her workforce. Alternatively, Sarah could have negotiated a new completion date. Either choice re requires talking to the customer. Sarah avoided this so far, but I think the customer would appreciate a mature PM who proactively attempt to resolve problems rather than hiding denying until it was too late to do anything about it. The reality is that the schedule is contextual. If the PM were to initiate proactive measures, including talks with the customer, the project could be brought to a mutually beneficial conclusion using a blended approach. Having some experience as a project manager, Sarah felt that she was making the best decisions based on the information she had as well as her experience. However, we have shown in our review of Sarah's case study that by implementing policies that allowed for language in the contract that add flexibility of the schedule and budget due to resource availability once the go-ahead date is reached and the effective use of schedule compression crashing techniques, this type of issue can be planned for and the risk can be mitigated ahead of time. The most surprising thing about this case to us was how Sarah failed to mitigate the risk of unavailable resources even though she was fairly sure the resources would be unavailable due to the amount of time between the contract and the start date. And this was long prior to the go-ahead date. The information in this case may be important to all businesses, especially those that deal with government contracts because there will definitely be times where there is a significant time lapse between the bid to the bid between bids to contracts to work starting and that needs to be accounted for in the bids and contract. Collectively, even though we may all not go into project management as a field, we may all end up managing projects at one point or another. Having a good understanding of these project management concepts will help us be successful in those and all of our endeavors.